Let me pray. Jesus, bless this time. I pray for your Holy Spirit to speak today, Lord. Uh, I, I'm just uh, your servant. You speak today. And, uh, and Lord, all of this, Lord, use it in our hearts uh, to prepare us so that we trust you and are lights in the darkness, Jesus. This is the time the world needs to see you. Uh, we pray in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. So let's wrap it up. Next week we got pickleball. And I don't want to. I don't want to overlap pick my this with pickleball. So we're we're gonna wrap it up, wrap it up today. And we're talking about the kingdom today. Last time we finished up talking about the return of Jesus Christ uh, with the church. We are back on earth with him. At the end, there's a final battle. It is uh, a, a gathering of the most powerful nations in the world against the Antichrist. And at the scene of that uh, gathering, Jesus returns at that moment and fulfills prophecy, and we're going to look at the prophecies that are fulfilled today. So if you go back to my original outline on Revelation, the book of Revelation, and again, all of these are on the church website. You can go on the website, find the class, and you can download everything and watch videos of all the past classes. If you go on there, one, one of the handouts, I give you this outline of the book of Revelation to help you, and we are now uh, at, uh, into the reign of Christ. We're outside of the tribulation period, and the judgments that lead after that, and we're into the thousand-year reign of Christ, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we, there is a glimpse earlier in Revelation of the 144,000 standing together with Jesus uh, after the end of the battle. They have all been saved, and then we're going, to, uh, we're going to talk today about what the significance of the kingdom that Jesus couldn't stop talking about. This is what he's talking about, people. That's what we're talking about today that kingdom. Okay, also referred to as the millennium or the millennial reign of Christ. So this is the passage that most clearly explains it in all of prophetic literature. It's the begin Here's the first three verses in that passage in Revelation 20. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the, king to the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. The millennium is the thousand years. This phrase appears many times here at the beginning of Revelation 20, which is following on the return of Christ in Revelation chapter 19. So Jesus is now here, and he is about to reign for 1,000 years, and Satan is locked out of that. Um, that's point one. Christ will reign over the whole world as Prince of Peace. Uh, it's, did I, is this an old version of this? Wait a minute. No, it's coming, I see. I thought I did my mistake from last time, and I have an old version of my PowerPoint. Christ will reign over the whole world as Prince of Peace. Um, there are many, many... Old Testament prophecies about the, the, of the branch of David, the one who would come, who would rule over the entire world and over all the nations of the earth. Many, many prophecies about that. He will rule from Jerusalem, which will function as the center of world government. Jerusalem will be the central city in the world during this thousand years, and Jesus will reign there. Okay, so I already gave you that passage from Revelation. Um, here, here is one of the sample prophecies. For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the gr greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This has not happened yet. This is not happening. Jesus is not reigning in this place in fulfillment of this prophecy. It has not yet started. That was broken from the crucifixion all the way to the time of his return as we see him, King of Kings. We saw that at the end of Revelation 19. This is the prophecy, though. It's, it's, it's a peculiar prophecy because it gives terminology that can only be true of God, and yet it is talking about a man who will reign on David's throne. What a paradox for the Jews in the Old Testament time trying to make sense of this. How can God reign and also a man reign? And now we know. Yeah, now we know who he is. 
And if you remember, we, we set this all up looking back at the book of Daniel. There are a number of different prophecies there, which were set up to establish a chronological order of kingdoms on earth. This is not a spiritual thing in some sense. Jesus, it's not talking about him reigning from heaven in some spiritual way while everything goes bad down here. It's, it's exactly the opposite. If you read here in Daniel 7, you have the Ancient of Days. Um, books were opened. This is the scene of the judgment that we already have been lo we're looking at in Revelation chapter 19 and we're going to see um, at the end of the tribulation time. So it's in the time frame of final judgment that this prophecy is talking, describing. Then I continue to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. We now know and have talked about it. That is the Antichrist. This is the last seven years, last three and a half years of the seven years. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. Exactly what we've been reading about in the book of Revelation. Daniel prophesied here uh, 700 years before John wrote his, his revelation. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, in other words, but were allowed to live for a period of time. So Babylon was there, that's Iran, uh, or Iraq. Uh, Persia was there, Iran. Uh, these, uh, Greece is there. They're, they're allowed to live, they still live. Uh, but in the end, their rules come to a final end. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. That's where Jesus gets this name he gives to himself, this, this very um, obscure reference that he makes to his, himself. He, appeared, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This, the millennium is the fulfillment of this prophecy. It is a rule of Jesus Christ on earth. Daniel had also talked about it back in chapter 2. He get, Remember Nebuchadnezzar's original prophecy. We've covered this in past classes if you're interest, interested and you weren't here for those. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, he's interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. That's a resurrected Roman uh, empire made of a ten-nation, uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking confederation uh, at that time. And in the time of those kings, that final European Union, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain. Jesus is that rock, the king, his kingdom, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. This is the fulfillment. The intention God's had all along is to put Jesus in charge of the earth and to reign over the earth and to fulfill every promise God has ever made to Israel in the Old Testament, and the church, we share in all of those promises. But that means, if that's true, and, and today I think some of the verses also we're looking at show that, that the, uh, in Pastor Frank's talk, that God has every intention of literally fulfilling his promises, and we've seen it happen in, in the resurrection of the nation of Israel. Okay. So, second feature of this thousand years, Jerusalem will be raised up topographically, so that it is the highest mountain in the area. Very strange, there are geological changes that happen in, in, at the end of the tribulation, and Jerusalem ends up lifted up, at, at just uh, topographically. And other amazing topographical changes in Judea, we know there are massive earthquakes, per, perhaps uh, caused by nuclear bombs in this time frame. Uh, we're not really sure, but we do know that the geography changes. Uh, so here's Zechariah 14. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord, and his name the only name. No other religions will be existing during the thousand years where Jesus is reigning. There's one religion on the earth at this point. The whole land... So, uh, tolerance is, is gone in the face of truth. The resurrected Christ, who never dies, will be reigning, and people are forced to accept him now because they can see him for who he is. Yes? One religion, Christianity or Judaism? It's, I don't know what you'll call it. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you call it. Christianity. We'll call it Christianity, but it doesn't matter. It's the fulfillment of everything in the entire Bible uh, that is here. So, uh, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. Uh, the whole land from Geba to Rimon, south of Jerusalem, will become like the Arabah. But Jerusalem will be raised up high from the Benjamin Gate to the site of the first gate to the corner gate and from the Tower of Hananel to the royal wine press and will remain in its place. It will be inhabited. Never again will it be destroyed. Jerusalem will be secure. So we are talking about the same thing that Frank covered in this time frame. The, it, once Jerusalem is restored and once Jesus has returned, the, it is, all of God's promises about the kingdom are fulfilled. God will make a new everlasting covenant with Israel. God will keep every promise he has made to Israel. Abrahamic, Davidic, Noahic, uh, etc. during this time period and every Jew will personally know the Lord that's clear he will he will put his spirit in the hearts of all his people so Jeremiah 31 this is the prophecy the days are coming declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them declares the Lord this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord. They will all know me, all of them. Yeah, no divided Israel anymore. No more Messianic versus uh, Orthodox Israel any longer. Everybody knows the Lord as he is. For I will forgive their wickedness. I will remember their sins no more. Feel free to stop me at any moment. The, the reign of Christ will be a time of unprecedented peace. What Antichrist promises, what the AI God will promise you, is peace and safety. It's fake. It's a substitute. It's like Splenda. <laughs> versus honey. Right? Have you ever had Maluka honey? Oh my, so good. Yeah, we've got cheap processed imitations. This is, the, this is the king of kings now who lives forever and loves us, and he's going to take charge. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates peace. The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. Now we're going into the new heavens and the new earth. We'll get to this passage in Revelation. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Okay, point five. Jerusalem will be the center of worship for the entire world. A new temple of enormous dimensions will be built in Jerusalem as the center of worship of Jesus Christ. Okay, so this is, this is not... My guess is with the, with the changes and the b battles and all that, the, the third temple that Frank is talking about today is probably in bad shape by the end of the tribulation. There's going to be a new temple coming. It will be built under the direction of Jesus. So you know it's going to be exactly what it's supposed to be. Only the Lord God will be worshipped throughout the world. Okay, Zechariah 13. On that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. On, only the, the power of the sacrifice is now the man who stands in that temple. He provides the forgiveness. No, don't need animal sacrifices anymore. On that day I will banish the names of the idols from the land, and they will be remembered no more, declares the Lord Almighty. I will remove both the prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. See, this has not happened yet. You see that? Like, we're talking about things that did not happen unless you take them in some really vague way about the past. But to specifically, we're waiting for this. He's, when, God, when there are no more idols anywhere, uh, where there's no more uh, uh, Islamic uh, temples, and there is no more you know, Hindu statues, all of that's gone because now God walks here with the people of the earth. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord, and His name the only name. We're all going to worship the same God. Not different names for God, but one God. Six, the damage wrought during the tribulation. Yes. I think so. So that's a great question. So we have returned to earth with Jesus at the beginning of this kingdom. And it's a little difficult to wrap your head around it, okay? But picture the resurrection. If you want to know what you're going to be like when you're resurrected, picture the resurrected Jesus. 
because you're going to be like him. He was walking around with people, just normal, right? And they could even see, you know, scars in his hands and things like this. So do I think we're all going to be here for that thousand years? Yes. I think we're all going to live through the thousand years because we're never going to die again. So just like Jesus, we're going to be here and we're going to be doing what he needs us to do in the world. What that looks like, it, if there's more for us spiritually, it, you know, in the universe, we don't really know what God's got cooking, you know, outside of this world. Maybe we do something else also. I, I don't know about that. But I believe, yes, we are here with him. When we come back with him, we stay with him at the end of Revelation 19. Yes. Of the what? The, the purpose is this idea, God's made this promise to Israel that um, he, would, he would be king. That's basically the idea. He's all, God's always wanted to be our king and to provide for his, his children. And, but we've insisted, nope, nope, we don't want you, right? Across human history. So at, we're, he, he's let all these other nations exist, have dominion, have tyranny, and then in the end, he's going to show them, this is what I was offering you all along. Like, what does it look like when someone that is perfectly wise and loving rules the earth with all power? And so he's going to reveal the depths of his love through this administration, basically. So, so we learn something about God through this, and, and he's made promises that he was going to do this. So we've been subjected to all these incredible empires that have destroyed us really across human history and we're dealing right now with a, a lot of tyranny in our world today and some of it here in our country and all of this is going to be pushed aside and we're going to see what it looks like when Jesus is the king of kings that's so that's why God wants to show us that and he's also keeping his promise to to do what he said he was going to do yes Yes, yes. So, yes, yes, yeah. There's still evangelism going on. So at the end of the thousand years, um, the only people that are left alive at the end of the thousand years are Christians and Jews who have not been put to death by the Antichrist. And there will be people that will survive. That's why Jesus tells the nation to flee into the mountains here. Uh, it's a dual prophecy. He's saying something to people in the first century, but then we know from Matthew 24, the big one that he's really talking about is the one at the end times when uh, Antichrist uh, takes over the temple and sets up his image. So, so there will be people left over. I don't know how many people will be left alive on the earth, but Jesus will start the kingdom and the entire kingdom will be Christians at that point, or, or Jews who have accepted Christ. Th those are the only people left. Uh, we come through the, the judgment there. I, we talked about the judgment of the nations, and uh, Jesus separates people out. Saved people enter the kingdom, but then they have kids. Okay, so, and now we don't have Satan in the picture for the first time, and people will still, some people, won't want to believe. We don't know how bad it gets, but we know it's bad enough that at the end of the thousand years, Satan has a comeback. Right, but it, but but you can imagine that it's going to be very rare that there are going to be people that that don't actually end up trusting in Christ during that thousand years as He's reigning. Yes, yes, yes. So at the time of the rapture, which precedes the tribulation, in my theory, we talked about it before all the bad stuff starts to happen. Uh, you know, and w w are we going to see the Temple Mount split the way Frank is talking? I don't know. We don't necessarily, we could be taken any moment, people. That could happen right after that. So, but we can, s the fact that it's getting close is mind-boggling. And, but, but yes, we are going to be caught up in the clouds with Jesus. We know that in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 5, 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, we're caught up in the clouds. And he describes that event, and that's where we get bodies to be like Jesus. Then we return with him in Revelation 19. He says that his holy ones are with him when he returns at the Battle of Armageddon. We come down, we're coming back, we're caught up in the clouds in joy, in, 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 uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. And then we're, we return with Jesus at, at the scene of battle in Revelation 19. They're not the same thing. If you read 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, clearly it's a joyful reunion with all our loved ones in the clouds with Jesus. 
and then there's a scene of apocalyptic, apocalyptic battle in Revelation 19 when we return. They, they can't be the same event, doesn't even make sense. So, so, the, the dual, so we will have new bodies at this time. So when this time, uh, when we come down to do battle, we're staying here. And we're going to be like Jesus. We're going to look like people, just like Jesus looked like a person, but we're going to have powers. Right? We're going to have powers. And we're, we're, I don't know exactly. Jesus could float up into the sky. So I don't know what all the... But I do know that we're never going to die again. And I can tell you, you're not going to sin anymore. So yeah, your righteousness is baked into you at that point, And uh, you don't ever have to... So there's, sin has no impact on you. Addictions, gone. Sin, gone. Everything, gone. You, you will be able to stand strong and serve the Lord at that point. And if, some, if Satan tried to tempt you with some crazy idea, you go, nah, not doing that. So just like now, some of us do that, and then sometimes we go, well, that sounds kind of interesting, right? <laughs> that's the part of me that's not going into the new body, right? Okay, all right, so uh, the damaged rot will be removed. The earth will be fruitful. Deserts will blossom. Rain and food will be plentiful, and animals will live in peaceful coexistence with people and each other. Uh, here's Ezekiel 36. This is what the sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, he's talking to Israel here, I will resettle your towns, the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say, this land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you that remain, <laughs> not, not, not so many at that point, will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. So God is going to restore the earth during this. And if you remember what we covered in the bold judgments, the world's in bad shape. The oceans are polluted. The fresh water's polluted. Uh, there's all kinds of disease. Jesus comes into that. We are there, and maybe we are part of this restoration process. So imagine all your skills as a land planner, okay, as a, you know, architect, as a, you know, as an organizer of teams, right? That's what my wife does. She organizes all these things. Imagine that, only, only you, you are now in a body with an intelligence and with resources and strength, brilliance to be like unstoppable for Jesus. And imagine the world that then comes out of that. I think the Lord touches the world, he heals it, and he uses us in that world. And, he, and it becomes a paradise during that thousand years. Everything that we ever wanted, um, we, you know, who knows what ideas. We'll, we'll figure out how to rebuild. The Lord will give us the wisdom and knowledge to rebuild everything during that time. We're going to work with him at that. I'm, I'm confident. And we're going to get the kingdom that he promised us. Yes. This is the kingdom that we have been praying for. Yes. Yes, this is it. From, uh, on earth as it is in heaven. It's not here yet, people. It, it's only here in a sense, right? It's he, in here right now. Okay, you, the king, God rules here, but he's not ruling here. Okay, Joe Biden's ruling here. Okay, so and then Putin's over there and we've got people that are ruling this stuff and they're not doing all the things that, you know, Jesus wants them to do. And, and this is all going to change and the world will be blessed under this. The, the loving, powerful God will uh, be the it, it's a theocracy is what we're going to end up with. Yeah, our, our best interests are going to be fulfilled by the one who loves us. That's what we're coming to. All right, next, okay. Well, I, I, I have a quick question. You might have already explained this, but when, you talk, when people are, that talk about the kingdom is now versus later, what is the difference? Okay, so, so part, the kingdom is here in a sense. It's, 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 it's here because the rule of Christ is here, but it's not this rule. So this rule is a literal, political, physical rule on earth of Jesus Christ. That is not here yet. We don't see that until after Jesus' return. We're waiting for that. But yes, the kingdom of God is among us. It's here. It's here in a sense. It's, it's sort of building. It's the mustard seed. Remember Jesus' parable of the mustard seed? It starts very tiny and it grows and grows and grows and grows. Well, when does it hit fruition? Right now, right there. So it's here. It's building because it's in us. The Spirit of God is here. Where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom, there is power. He is here. But Jesus is not reigning yet. So in a sense, the kingdom's now, but it's not this kingdom yet. This is the full-grown mustard. It's the mustard plant we're waiting for, and that's what this is. So it's building, though. 
This lady right here, that's an excellent question. I don't, I don't know who you are, but very good question. Yes. You're saying it's building. However, you know, on the news and what have you, they say that the believers are diminishing now. Yes. The kingdom grows, but it's being pared back in certain senses, right? Yeah. But, but the, people, the people who truly know and follow Christ, the faithful remnant remain. But you're right. Uh, the, the actual outworking of the church seems much less influential in the world and much, in much lower percentage uh, uh, acceptance today than we've seen it in, in quite a long time. But Jesus, Jesus did predict that. We looked at that in Matthew 24. There will be a falling away at the end. Paul talks about it in 2, Th- 2 Thessalonians 2. It's one of the things we expect to happen before the return of Christ, and it's going to get worse. It's gonna, the AI God is going to impose its will and nobody's going to see a use for, for the true God once that happens. That's, and, and that's how the AI achieves what it's going to achieve. That's another talk. If you want to go back and look at that, I've been speaking about that through the series. So that's my suspicion of how it goes through based on what I'm reading. Okay, let me read you this passage from Isaiah 11. So you can tell the Old Testament, and you see why we study the Old Testament? Because it's true. Because it's true and it's literally true. So, that, I mean, that's our approach. And we'll talk in a second about a different view on the kingdom that comes from a non-literal approach where people take it all symbolically. But see, here's what we know. For thousands of years, 2,000 years, people looked at the Old Testament and said, this can't be literally true. There is no Israel. So we got to rethink this. And so everybody, you know, the Catholic Church and then the Reformers, they're like, well, it's got to still be true, but it must not be a literal truth. It must be a, some kind of you know, a metaphor, like Frank said, or a allegory, or a spiritualized truth. So, you know, so we don't read it literally. Guess what? Now you can read it literally. But there are a lot of people in the world, parts of Christianity, that are dug in on a confessional position that was made before Israel came back. This is kind of recent. It's 75 years. So all these large denominations, Presbyterians uh, and the Roman Catholic Church as two examples, they're, they're dug in on a, on a position now where the end times is, the book of Revelation is not about the future uh, because it can't be, you know, because it mentions Israel. And also m- all these prophecies in the Old Testament, they've taken them all for the church and said, well, they're not for Israel, the nation of Israel. There is no nation of Israel. Israel must be the church is the argument. But, but it, even though there are difficulties with that position, it's been the dominant position. But now we know there is an Israel. They're back. It's God's plans coming together. Yes? Um, for a long time, I think uh, we have been, I, I mean, in my group, that the rapture, that all the things that have to happen as predicted in the Bible have, have happened before the rapture. So we're not waiting anything for any significant event yes. to come before the rapture. I, 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 I agree. Mm. about the division of the control in the Temple Mount. Yeah. Uh, he, he mentioned it in one of the Old Testament. What does it mean? Does it mean that the rapture will come before the actual division of the control mm. of the Temple Mount or after? The, the answer to that is it doesn't matter. It could happen either way. So if, if this goes, we know that the, there are prophecies. We know that the temple is going to be reactivated in Israel. It has to be in order for the Antichrist to defile it at the halfway point. We looked at that, the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist, with the help of this individual called the false prophet, sets up an image in the temple. The image has, it, it's a thing, but it can speak, and it causes the, the people of the world to worship it. Okay, I I'm, I'm have an uh, explanation for what that is that makes perfect sense of it now. So, but, but that, for that to happen, we have to have a temple. And the weird thing is in the prophetic picture, and especially in the book of Daniel when he says this, is that the temple's destroyed by the Romans. But somehow then Antichrist puts a halt to sacrifices in the temple three and a half years into the tribulation. Well, the, the solution between those is there's the gap. We're in that time of the gap. This is the church age. Then, and, and somewhere in this process, Israel comes back and the temple comes back. But the temple doesn't have to come back before we get taken out. 
The temple could come back right after that. The temple could come back. It just needs to be there for the last three and a half years to be defiled at the halfway point. So, but it is chilling if, if, that, if this happens. Uh, it's just yet another thing which makes you think we're right at the edge. So it may be a little bit too big a pi uh, picture. So yeah, our, Frank and I were like, is Jesus coming back like any, any moment now? I mean, we're just, we are definitely like kind of, uh, the hair's standing up on my neck too, just like what Frank says. So it, it, it is definitely, the, it is the last thing that must be in place for the tribulation to happen, but it doesn't have to happen before the tribulation starts. So, so but if it does, but it could, if it, it could, and that would be astonishing to the world because it's fulfilled prophecy like Frank was showing you today. Okay, so this is the prophecy of Jesus. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Man, do we need that as our king right there. He will not judge by what he sees with his ears or decide by what he sees with his ears, or eyes or ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy and with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. This is another picture. Uh, righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant, sounds like we're going vegan, doesn't it? The infant will play near the, get ready, you might want to start now, I don't know. <laughs> the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. A completely different kind of world. So something fundamentally, the curse, the curse is gone. Do you see it? The curse that was given to Adam and Eve is gone during the thousand years. It's taken away. And all of a sudden, even the animals don't want to kill each other anymore. It's because of the curse. So diseases, disasters, they go away during this thousand years. That's the world we're talking about uh, under, with no, no curse in it any longer. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. Resting place doesn't mean where he dies. It means where he sits. Okay? So, so he's going, Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem over a world that is transformed and healed, and the curse of Garden of Eden is lifted from this land, and, and we are like in a place like the Garden of Eden. Like everything we always should have had from the beginning that we've messed up is now gone, wiped away. At, in our current earth, so there's another earth coming, but in this earth, for a thousand years, God does what he always promised he would do. Yes? Is that because in the, when he comes in the, the millennium, Everything that's changed, the curse disappears, is because all those things don't have free will, but man does, so man still retains sin. Yes. So then you have more, so there's two types of, we talked about this in the young adults group actually uh, Friday, there's two, there's two types of evil in the world. One is moral evil, this is the decisions people make, and then there is natural evil, okay, disease, uh, you know, accidents, children dying of starvation, there, there's something else. That evil is gone during the thousand years. The, the, all the evil in the world from the curse, all the, all the difficulties, the pain of childbirth, all of that is gone during this thousand years. The curse is lifted, we, the earth will be bountiful, man won't have to labor by the sweat of his brow to raise crops, the world will be fruitful like we've never seen before during this thousand years. So, yes. The day before Christ comes back, as I understand it, there's famine, there's contaminated water and all this stuff, but as soon as he comes back, all of that's good. Yeah, well, how long it takes him to work that out? Remember, we saw that passage which, which says 45 days, you know, blessed is the one who makes it to the 1335. Like, there's, I think there's a sense that there's a massive global cleanup under the power and authority and intelligence of, of God 
And, and he, he, we, we, probably as his helpers, the church, solve all these problems. How that happens, I don't know. My, my sense is, though, it, if it only took 45 days from the Armageddon to get to this world, that would be astonishing. But again, God has all knowledge. You think, is it a miracle? Or is it just, imagine the tech that the God of the universe could build to clean our world up through his servants who are no longer, you know, limited by our are these temporary bodies. I don't know what the, how it's going to work, but he will use one means or another to clean it up. So my sense is, if that's a 45-day gap, that during that time we see all of this largely implemented, but it could be that there's ongoing renewal and restoration through the thousand years also. We, it's not explained. We just know that the thousand years are like this, and that at least this much, the curse is lifted. So the fundamental rules of the universe change because of the curse. And you think about that. That's another talk. I don't want to get into that. But, but, but there, there, is, there, is, there is death on the earth that is natural death, and then there is unnatural death, the unnatural stuff. People get to live to be hundreds of years old. I'll show you that passage. Yes? Yes, yes. So the, the curse on the creation in Romans 8, yes. Yes, exactly, very good. That's lifted on the reveal. It is in Romans 8. Paul says that the reveal, the, even the creation is yearning for the revealing of the, of, the, of the children of God. That's us. When we return at that moment with Jesus, the curse is lifted. Yes. Yes. The curse is on everything. Yes, everything is affected by the curse. The entire world is broken and not what it's supposed to be. That part gets healed. Everybody's a Christian at the beginning of the thousand years. Some of the kids down the line, some of the nations fall away. We know that. But at the start of this, it's, it's going great. Jesus is reigning. Everybody's worshiped. The whole world is worshiping him. Uh, but there is a hiccup toward the end. So that's for sure. Yes. Um, I, no, I, the world itself doesn't, we, we're coming to that. I think, I think in the, I, I, there's no more oceans in the, in the new earth. Yeah, when we get to the new earth, there's no more ocean. So, which I like the ocean, but, <laughs> but I think there's even better things that we don't even see yet. So, okay, let me keep going. There will be no more sickness or deformity. People will live to be centuries old. Here's that passage. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. This is, this is more forward-directed. This is Revelation 21. We'll get to that. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years the one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. So there's still some way for somebody to slip in a bathtub and, and die, but it's going to be that kind of thing. It's not going to be, you know, there's not going to be the, it, sickness. There's going to be no more cancer, people. That it will be gone. That's part of the curse. Yeah. Okay, eight. The millennium will end with a final revolt led by Satan. So at the end of a thousand years, if you can believe it, there are enough people that are ticked off at the rule of Christ that they are going to rebel. Satan is released. When the revolt is crushed, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. After this, the final judgment of unbelievers takes place and God creates a new heavens and a new earth. So here's the second part of that Revelation 20 passage on the kingdom. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. Uh, in number, they are like the sand on the seashore. So again, a huge army is rallied against Jesus at the end of this time frame. They marched across. Who knows what tech they have? Maybe they feel indestructible, these people, in this time. Who knows? 
They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. There's Jerusalem again at the center. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. See, this is not the final battle. In the final battle in, in Revelation 19, in, in Armageddon, we come down from heaven and with Jesus. This is, this is just the power of God coming down and destroying all these armies. And this is then. So what does this go to show us? You can't blame Satan for human sin. Because even in a perfect world, people still don't choose Jesus. In, in a perfect world. It's what happened in Eden, right? Isn't this just like, it's the bookend. It, the Garden of Eden, they're walking with God. They're friends of God. And they turn against Him. And you think, how could they possibly have done that? Well, it's the, the human heart is easy for, to be deceived. It's easy. Sa Satan's lies are compelling. And today... Today, his lies are compelling, and he wants, he wants to destroy your life today, and he's not going to stop until he's finally taken care of at the end. Right? That's what we know from this. Don't, don't think, oh, I'm indestructible. I'm never going to turn away from Jesus. Oh, you be on guard. That's what Peter says, right? Be on guard. Your enemy is prowling. It's a reminder to us. Okay, so there, there, we've been talking about this thousand-year reign, and I want to talk about it because not all Christians believe this, and I want to talk about the different views here um, toward the end of this and just say a couple things about it. Um, again, feel free to ask any questions. We've got time. But the, the, the one view, and this is mostly gone now as a view, is called a post-millennial view. And in the post-millennial view, let me draw a picture for you. Uh, in the post-millennial view, we have uh, sort of the church age, and we have a time of tribulation. And sometimes these people consider the entire church age. Might, they might read the book of Revelation up to chapter 20 as kind of a summary of the past, uh, or, or some of them take it as the first century. But it's a time of tribulation, right? Um, and it leads up uh, to a time of uh, the millennial kingdom. So, in other words, things get better. The church is in charge. The church is bringing, making the world better. Christians are voting. Everything's getting better and better and better. And then at the end of that, that's the thousand years. Jesus is not reigning on earth. Okay, he can't be. You know, he's not here. But he's kind of reigning through the church down here. But there is a kingdom. It's a, there's a thousand year kingdom. Some of them think it's literal. Some of them think it's longer. It doesn't matter. But the, the post-millennium. And then... We, Jesus is reigning, then Jesus comes back with the church at the end, okay? It's post-millennium. So, so we come back at the end of the thousand years in the post-millennial position. The world just gets bigger and bit better, transformed by the power of the gospel until things are so good at the end, then we come back. And then, see, Satan breaks out his little trial right here, and we take him down, Right? So that's the idea. So that would mean Jesus comes back. This is also the rapture. Uh, this is also the last judgment. It kind of just, it, it kinda just uh, uh, simplifies everything. But there's a big problem with this view. And it's why nobody believes, hardly anybody believes this anymore. Things are not getting better. Things are getting worse. So it, this, this, it, there was a time of optimism even in our country. We had the United States. You know, and the United States, a nation founded under God, and we say, this could be the beginning of the kingdom. Could be centered right here, right? And now all of a sudden we're looking around and things are getting worse and worse and worse. So this view is pretty much gone now. Um, but it was a popular view, and among people coming from more of a liberal perspective, social gospel, uh, you know, believe, we're, see, we're fighting racism, we're doing all these great things, you know, so it must be that, that this is the kingdom that we're in. And, but now we look around and we see more violence and depression and drug addiction than ever and we're realizing man we need Jesus and he can't be reigning over this like I wouldn't I wouldn't put that on him right it's because he's not here he's because he's not here that this uh, view is there and here um, Matthew 24 look and, but Jesus predicts things getting worse he says you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death you'll be hated at that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. See, this, that, that, Jesus' words uh, are, sound pessimistic about the time leading up to his return, not optimistic. So that's, why, that's just one of the reasons why this view is pretty much gone now. But it was huge. It was the dominant view for a long time. It seemed like everything was getting better and God's values were being voted in all the time, right? 
Okay, so next view is called the amillennial view. This is the biggest view in the world right now. It's the, the view of the Roman Catholic Church, most of the reformed, larger reformed denominations. It was carved out in long time past in church history. Uh, Augustine, uh, Frank mentioned, some of the early church fathers, it made sense there was no Israel anymore. We have to read the Bible and spiritualize it to get it to all apply, so there's no literal kingdom, uh, is the idea. And so in the amillennial view, um, the, 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 millennium, we're, the whole thing is millennium. So it's not a literal thousand years. Thousand years is a figure of speech, is the way they say it. So we have Jesus here, we have the crucifixion, we have this time frame, we're calling this millennium. This is the church age. So Jesus is reigning right now, kind of like this. He's reigning right now over the church. And again, most people believe this. The Pope has spoken on this, some past popes. So it's enshrined in doctrine. And it made, again, it made a lot of sense because there was no literal Israel in God's plan. So they just took the, the entire book of Revelation basically is symbolic, is the way, and with no specific reference to any historical event. Um, so there is a millennium. Now, out here, Jesus returns. Oh, and, and down out here is uh, Satan, uh, the, the one we just, Satan coming. So J Satan's been bound, but now Satan is loosed. Some people that believe this believe, you know, today that Satan's alive now. He's been let out of the millennial prison. He's deceiving the nations right now. This is that battle. And Jesus is coming back at that battle with us. So that means uh, also the rapture, all of this. There is no rapture. There is no tribulation period specifically. The tribulation could be this time here toward the end. But again, it's not literally seven years. It's some long time. Maybe it's, you know, 100 years, whatever. It's not literal. The book of Revelation is not literal in this view. This is the Amil view. I know, I know many wonderful, wonderful Christians. I'm not going to name any, but I mean, I know many wonderful Christians who believe this view. It's, there's not, this is not, a, this is not a, a thing that should divide us. I just need you to be aware that this is the view. That there are denominations that have held this for, for you know, since the re time of the Reformation, long before there was a nation of Israel. Um, and so... You know, to them, they're like, your view is too complicated. Here we have one resurrection, one rapture, it's all the same thing, one battle, you know. You, you got us going up into the sky, coming back down, up again, coming down. That's how they talk about it, right? And I'm like, but that's how it, it's, it's explained. So, you know, that's why we believe that, you know. And then out here is the new heaven and the new earth. So, again, this is not a salvation issue. It's a, it's a, but but it, 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 again, the big problem with this is, it, you have to take the Bible in the vaguest, most symbolic way possible. You do damage to the text. See, this is the beauty of just reading it and believing what it says. If God says, I'm going to put somebody on the throne of David ruling from Jerusalem, got it. Okay, we just go with that. We don't have to, like, they, 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 uh, you wouldn't imagine there's as much teaching from the Old Testament it went, once people do that, because the Old Testament really isn't very specific about anything that exists anymore. It's just some vague reference to some generic blessing, and it no longer becomes a, a, a specific revelation of God's promises. So, so it's a, it does a little damage. So that's, that's how they look at it. But when we read the passage, the book, thousand years, I mean, how many times does he got to repeat this? A thousand years is not a symbol. A thousand years is a thousand years. So we know about the kingdom, but we didn't know how long it was in the Old Testament. This passage tells us exactly how long it is, right? Okay, so here's some other, so here's 1 Corinthians 15. I actually mentioned this in communion today. But look at, look at the sequence of events Paul is here, 1 First, First Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection of Christians, which is what we call also the rapture. Um, and look at the sequence of events he puts here. There is not one resurrection. There are many. Look at this. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Resurrection number one. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn... Okay, see, sequence of events. Each in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, like he promised in John 14, where I've gone, I will come and take you to be with me, for there are many mansions. Remember that promise? He's taking you up to be with him. That's, that's different from coming back when we're going to beat Russia and China. Okay, when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come 
when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power, after the end of the millennium. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. That's millennium. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then, last in the event, this is the end of the book of Revelation, the very end, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. So after the resurrection, new heaven and a new earth, it's just God at that point. It's not even just Jesus, it's God as, as a whole uh, that is o- over everything. We'll, we'll look at that passage in a second. But this is a fascinating passage because it doesn't make sense of the millennium. It actually is setting up, you don't have to jump everything together <coughs> of the Amil version. It, it actually sets up a sequence of events that lead to the end. It's exactly what we've been talking about as we've been going through the text. Okay, and finally the pre mill view, which is what we're talking about in here. And the pre-mill view, there's actually two flavors of it, um, but we're, it's, oh, it's the same passage. Okay, so we're, we're just reading this and we're just saying, this is what it is. So we're reading this literally, this is how it happens. There's a coming thousand years uh, that happens. We know that that, so here's the timeline. Um, here's, here's we, in our view, in the dispensational view, there's a rapture. That's where the church is removed. That's 1 Corinthians 15. That's uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Okay, that happens. Rapture. Then we have tribulation. Okay, seven years, uh, halfway point, uh, three and a half years, time times and half a time. We've been looking at that. 1260 days, 42 months. Remember, the Gentiles tread on Israel. Um, 42 tread months. That's three and a half years. Okay, so rapture, tribulation, period, halfway point. Then Jesus comes back. Sorry, Amil, got to make room here. Jesus comes back with the church. Yep, so that means he's coming twice. That's exactly one. Here's his appearing for, to bring the church to be with him. Here's his return to do battle, and we're with him at this, right? So he returns back here at the at tribulation, and now from that we end up with a thousand-year reign of Christ at the millennium. Right? And then out here, there's a new heavens and earth. We'll look at that in a second. He, the, the earth is gone after this. So the old earth is not going to work for us people for eternity. It's not, this world is not going to work for us. We're, we're going to have a, we, we need a new earth at that time. Okay? So this is the pre-trip, this is the pre-millennial view. This is, yeah, pre-mill means Jesus comes back right before the thousand years. Here, both of these view, views, both amill and post-mill, are, are post-millennial. Uh, so in a sense, uh, here there is no thousand years in the Amil view, it's just all time. Uh, and up here, it can be a literal thousand years, but it doesn't matter, Jesus comes back at the end of it. So here we're saying, nope, he comes back before it. And, and in the dispensational view, uh, which I'm explaining, in fact, when he comes back um, not only before it, but before a, seven, a literal seven year tribulation uh, time. The, the dispensational view, I'll just, again, I've talked about it, all, dispensationalism is a hermeneutical approach. It is a way, it is a strategy for reading the Bible. Read it literally. Uh, it's the simplest way I can explain it to you. There are ideas and concepts that come with that view, but the, at its core, it's, it's a way of interpreting Scripture. If it says it and it's not obviously symbolic, don't take it symbolic. If you read the Bible that way, you get this view, okay? Again, not popular until, you know, more recent times with the, with the reappearance of Israel, all of a sudden we can read the Bible literally again, and it makes perfect sense, and the promises all make literal sense again, and so th- that's the view we're talking about in here, and we don't have to spiritualize it away and say Jesus is reigning right now, uh, from, but from heaven, not in literal fulfillment of the Old Testament, right? Okay, so those are the three views uh, of the millennium. Any questions before I talk about this cool thing right out here? Because we're going to rushing through this. Yes. Whatever view one may take, what is the role of us as a Christian in these times? Because you know. Yes. So, so you, can, you can see that the cool thing about this view, and that doesn't mean it's true, but the cool thing about it is the sense of imminency. Jesus can come back any moment. 
It's like, and, and as we look around the world and things seem worse and worse and worse, we realize we, we have no time to waste, people. We got to shine like lights be, because the, everything is looking like we're, we're, we're inching down to this moment right here. And, you know, we got loved ones who are going to be left behind if we can't reach them. So it's just, it's a sense of urgency. And isn't that what Jesus says? I'm coming like a thief in the night. He says, be ready. Don't be asleep. Uh, he's telling us that. This version makes the most sense of Jesus' own um, urgency to live a, a, a life a, as a light in this world and to live for him and not get drawn into the, this kingdom. This kingdom's going away. Don't be part of this. Be part of what's coming. These views, though, see, that because the, of the way they're looking at this, this one's crazy optimistic. And this one, again, it's so generic and vague that there's just no sense of, is Jesus coming back anytime soon? I'll talk to an amillennialist. Yeah, you know, probably in the next few thousand years or something. You know, it's just going to keep going. There's lots of ups and downs. They go, this is just a downtime. It's going to come back. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm but this view, we're realizing it's, it's built up. There's momentum. Satan is building momentum. And all of a sudden, boom, Christianity's in the way. And the AI God rises. And we got to get out of here. I'm out of here. Come with me. <laughs> Let's get out of here. I, that's my reading of it. I, I could be wrong, but, I, but that's my reading of it, yeah, of the text. Yes? So I think uh, the, the last view, whatever it is called. Pre-mill, yeah. That's the most common view. Uh, In evangelicalism it is. In evangelicalism it's the most common view. Uh, it's not the most common view in mainline uh, Christianity. It's not the Roman Catholic view. It's not Presbyterians. It's not, I don't th I'm not sure about Methodists. Lutherans believe amil. Almost, most, most of the old mainline denominations, the Re Reformation denominations, are amil. You're not going to get it in the Episcopal Church. Yeah. Episcopal Church. Anything coming that's connected to the Roman Catholic Church or spun directly off of that uh, is, is very likely this view. And the Reformers had a chance to do it different, but they just didn't see the urgency of breaking with, they saw the urgency of breaking with Catholicism on other stuff, but not on its view of, of the church and, and uh, through history and at the end. So they didn't really. So one of the signs, according to the premillennial view, is the signs of the rapture or the second coming of Christ. Yes. Knowledge explosion. That may be the AI, it's possible. Uh, possible, so yeah. Yeah. And it seems like the purpose of the rapture is just to get the believers out of here. Correct. Before the tribulation starts. Correct. All the more urgency to go and preach the gospel. All the more urgency. That was two, two classes ago we talked about this. So please see the video if you weren't there. That was a really good class. Yes. when we have the rapture coming, uh, it, it impacts the salvation well, the return of Christ. Yeah, so for them, the rapture is the return of Christ, is the end, um, is the judgment. Everything's all one thing for them. So, and they don't know when it is, yeah. but... But for us, for, for, uh, and so they, they believe that things are going to get bad. And no, I, I know some Amil people, and they think that we're near the end also. But they think that this is the tribulation. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, uh, we, we feel the most urgency. The, the evangelicals feel the most urgency based on, and we are the ones most likely to look around at circumstances in the world and say, this is exactly what we're waiting for right now. So, so that, I, that really does fire us up. That doesn't mean you go quit your job and pull your investments in and <laughs> don't do that. No, th there's nothing like that in the Bible. It's the exact opposite. No, you do even more what you're supposed to do and shine for the Lord. That's what you do in this time frame as we get close. Okay, so new heaven and a new earth. Let me, let me get to this, because this is how we're going to wrap this up. There's also a closing epilogue that's really beautiful with an angel talking to John, and you find out the angel or the angelic figure is, in fact, Jesus, and he says, uh, you know, listen to my words. It's just beautiful. But anyway, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. There it goes. New earth. It might be a lot bigger earth. Don't really know. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, 
from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Yeah, we, everybody left in existence at this point will have a resurrected body. Every, all of us. Everyone who's trusted in God, there's a resurrection that occurs after the end of the thousand years for everybody that died during the millennium. We know they get resurrected also. Uh, we know that from Revelation 20. So everybody's now in their new bodies, everybody that's ever lived and, and, and trusted in the Lord. Okay. One, the current heavens and earth will be replaced and renewed as God frees the created order from its bondage to sin and decay. So the, there are some things still stuck in the world, like that bathtub you could slip in, right? There, there still are some things, there, there's still some booby traps and things in the earth. It, it can't be, we still have nature. Nature can be dangerous, even if the animals aren't the ones that are eating you anymore. Um, all of that is eradicated. We have a completely new planet. God's intention has always been to replace the heavens and earth with a new creation. There's lots of verses about it. Um, here's 2 Peter 3, verses 7, and also verse 10. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Okay? We're going to get a, new, a completely new environment for eternity that God's going to rule from. Okay, no, please. Okay, what about the animals? Are they going to be glorified too? Um, <laughs> you know, the horses, uh, what about the puppy dogs? Are they, are they, they not going to be eating together? We just want to know the dogs go to heaven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to answer these questions. You're diverting my attention from this very important matter, and to the fact is I don't have an answer to that. So. That's all to cover up for the fact I have no idea. I, I don't... I don't know. Let's keep reading. I don't know if there's any animals mentioned here. I don't, I don't know if there's any animals. It's a good question. It sure seems like it'd be kind of boring eternity without animals, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But Okay, the center of the new earth is a new Jerusalem, which is described as being 12,000 stadia, 1,500 miles in width, height, and length. It's unclear if it's a cube or a pyramid. So it's unclear if this is... If the New Jerusalem, it, it says it's 1,200 stadia, 12,000 stadia, which is 1,500 miles. It could be, this is the city, boop, and it's 1,500, or is it like this? That's half the size of the United States. Yes. Here's the problem. So uh, assuming the earth were the same size, the New Jerusalem would be like that. I mean, uh, it, it would go outside of our atmosphere, right? So it would be it's kind of hard to figure out. So maybe the worth is a lot bigger, or maybe there's something else going on that we don't understand that God's going to do to pull this off, but he's going to do it. So this one's a little more streamlined. Maybe, that, maybe that's what it looks like. I don't know. But yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, this, this is... Uh, on our current earth, it would look like that if it was on it. So... Uh, there will be no temple in the New Jerusalem because the Lord um, God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. It will be the dwelling place of God's people for eternity, all whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, here's the passage. He carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It, it, jasper, probably diamond. Like, that's, that's the kind of stone it is. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Yeah. So just to tie into your, your earth, the one thing we have to remember, too, is that there's Currently, we're stuck in four dimensions, but there's actually at least ten. Okay, so there's a whole other thing. You're right. 
So there's, there's something going on here. Definitely, I'm telling you, there's something happening here that we don't understand with our current tech or this current world and the way the principles on which this world works. Um, and, but God is the one who can control all of that. So what he's going to do with that and the dimensions that are involved, that's a great question. I, I, I'm, I would be speculating. I'm already a big speculator. You know, that's why you're coming to my class. But uh, I'd, be, I'd be making stuff up at that point. Um, Okay, so there, uh, uh, the complete restoration of the damage done from the curse. Uh, so the old earth is just gone. Uh, there will be no more Grand Canyon, no more all the stuff that's part of the old earth. As beautiful as it is, there's a whole new beauty that's coming. There will no longer be night or the light of the sun. God himself will provide light. No more sun. Don't need it. Don't need it. Remember that other verse we looked at in Zechariah? Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. I made it right on time. I, any, final, any concluding questions? I'll be around. You can, you can always come up with one later and pitch it at me. What are they thinking now, or what will they be thinking then? There's going to be no Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses when we get to that point. Okay, let me pray. Jesus, Jesus, uh, thank you for um, your amazing love for us, Lord. Your plan is awesome and perfect. Uh, Lord Jesus, help us to be lights in the darkness as we are waiting these things. We are not afraid, Lord, because we know that you are at work and you have a plan. Uh, Jesus, you've, 75 years ago with Israel, to this day and into the future, Lord, your word is secure, your promise to us. Um, thank, you, thank you for the blessing and ministry time we've had here today. In your name, Lord. Amen. Amen.